Okay, let's do this. Hello, friends, and welcome to this installment of Plan First Wealth and Friends. This is a live show where James Boyle and myself, Richard Taylor, get together with our fellow professionals in the expat space. Someone has something of value or interest to share with our community of British expatriates in America, and we get them to tell us their story and spill the beans. With James and I today is fellow British financial planner in the US, Kath Derrison of 5e Financial. I'll allow Kath to introduce herself shortly. But headline, Kath is the founder of 5e Financial, a cross-border fee-only independent fiduciary financial planning firm based in Omaha, Nebraska, and Your Money Matters US, which looks like a very interesting financial education and coaching business, which I'm keen to talk about. Now, before we get to the good stuff, I just need to ask James to read a short disclaimer. Disclaimer, sorry, James. (laughs) Can't read, apparently. Perfect. Plant First Wealth is a registered investment advisor. The information presented today is for educational purposes only. Plant First Wealth does not provide any tax and or legal advice and strongly recommends that clients seek their own advice in these areas as always. If you happen to be tuning in live on any of our social media channels, feel free to comment any questions as we go here. We're happy to to stop out and chat through as we go. All right, Richard, back to you. All right. Thanks, James. Hi, Kath. Welcome Hi. to Plan First Wealth and Friends. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Of course. So I mean, let's get let's deal with the elephant in the room. So you're, I think it's fair to say you're a direct competitor of ours. And I think some people would be Hello, surprised. Baby. Yeah, I think some we, we deal with financial planning firm for Brits in America. And it seems to me that's pretty much what you do as well. And I think it would surprise some people that we've had got you on the show. But as far as I'm concerned, well, I'd rather be friends with you than enemies. And I think there's enough, plenty of business to go around and, and it'd be better to compare notes and discuss this together and see if we can learn from each other. Yeah, I'll tell you what though, I am particularly interested to hear about Your Money Matters as well. It looks like that's a coach, financial coaching business you're working on. I do think there's that's the, really the future of where this is going to go, I think, financial coaching. I don't know if you're familiar with Pete Matthews, but maybe we'll talk about that. But I have to ask, first of all, Yeah. how are you in, how did you find yourself in Omaha, Nebraska? Not really a long story, but it is in a kind of way. So my brother actually lives here as well. He met his wife or now wife in university in Swansea in the UK. And he came over here to marry her. So I came over for the wedding and spent a little bit of extra time here. Happened to meet my husband while I was here. So now we've moved over as well. So I have a 11 year old stepdaughter and a two year old little boy now. So we are here for at least a while. With regards to kind of immigration, my brother's going to be staying here, I'm sure, probably a longer time than I will. I think I'll probably end up doing like a 50-50 hybrid or something like that. Spending one foot in one place, one foot in another. Just to give you that. So your brother's wife is American and from Nebraska and she was studying at Swansea. Is that a year abroad kind of thing? Yeah, like the year abroad. She's actually from Iowa, but we're in Omaha. We're right on the border of Iowa. Mm -hmm. So it's just across the river. And was your, was your husband part of the wedding? Was he, or was it just a random from you picked up in Omaha? Yeah, (laughs) random. (laughs) And what's it like? What's Nebraska like? It's, it's different. I think living in a city, it's very much the same as other places. You've got, we've got a zoo, we've got a really good zoo. I'll just, I'll say that. I will give it its credit. The best zoo in the country voted on a regular basis. Best way that, I mean, I'm not by the Bronx Zoo. Zoo and the Bronx Zoo is pretty spectacular. This, we are Bronx, we are better than the Bronx Zoo apparently they're, they're voted number one every single year we do get obviously a lot of people come here for things like Berkshire Hathaway weekend yep. we also ho- host the College World Series there's a few things that do go on here that do bring people here but we don't have an international airport I think that that definitely hampers I would say the global situation in the city so we're not as globally minded as maybe some other places that do have direct flights out of the US but we do have obviously quite a lot of people who come here for those specific reasons instead it's a very hot and cold climate so in the winter it's brutal and in the summer it's also brutal but in the opposite directions yeah (laughs) so if you're flying back to the UK where do you fly via usually hopefully not through Chicago most times because that's probably I think the airport that gives me the most heart attacks when I have a little one to worry about just because their flight times are so tight on getting somewhere so we normally go through either like Charlotte Dallas, Fort Worth, somewhere like that. And where's home in the, where's, if you're going back to the UK, where are you going? Probably to my parents in Great Yarmouth in Norfolk. So they live right by the beach. So. Oh, nice. But that sounds really nice. But 
that's a hell of a journey back for you. If you're going from Omaha, Nebraska, connecting somewhere to, into London, presumably, and then you've got to get to Great Yarmouth, that's a mammoth that's a trip, journey. It is. And we've done it three times with the little one as well. He's two and he's done it three times so far and he's been fine. But yeah, it's definitely a, a trek. Fine. Fine is a relative term. I've got a four-year-old and a one-year-old. I, I haven't taken him since he's been able to actually tell me no, we haven't taken him. So might be different this next time <laughs> you know, this summer but a uh, passport situation in the u.s as we all know for my eldest a renewal of passport has taken 20 times as long as it normally does so yes yeah. a bit nuts what so do you feel what does it feel like out there i'm in greenwich connecticut just outside new york james is in philly i feel very i'm only a six hour fly i'm just not far from yeah. jfk i feel quite connected to america and to the uk what do you because of because of the like, Zoom and all the communications we've got, do you feel just as connected, or do you feel a disconnect? Yes and no. I don't feel like the culture here is easy to connect into in a lot of ways, but we do have me and my brother actually run a little British group. So Brits in Nebraska, we have a little, oh, yeah. little group. One of them owns a British confectionery shop locally. We can always go and get chocolate or whatever we need from there. We have like cups of tea. The kids are all friends. So we have connected that way with a few of the other members in the group. And we have a couple of meetups occasionally. But I think that it, there's definitely that lack of ability to go home so easily that does make you feel a bit more homesick. Yeah. Yeah. There's a British shop yeah. in Omaha. Yeah. I wasn't expecting that. Is it popular? Oh yeah, yeah, he's popular. What do what do America what do what does he tell you? What what's your favorite thing Americans buy in Omaha? I have no idea, but I'm sure it's anything because no offense to American chocolate, but it's just not. It just doesn't hit the spot. Yeah, <laughs> no, I agree. Reese's butternut. What a, I just can't. They're just oh, they're yeah, hugely they're popular. Not, and they're just they, like oh, you yeah. like them, don't you, James? No, <laughs> Reese's I could I could live with. Hershey's <laughs> is pretty rough. <laughs> You can get Cadbury's, or you could actually just shut down. You get Cadbury's near me, and I used to just, yeah. I love dairy milk. But there's Wegmans, which is, sounds strange saying this every time I say it, but it's just the best supermarket in the world. But Wegmans is open up. I can get Milka. Oh, Milka, and that's can, just... can you get a Galaxy? Can you get a Galaxy ripple? Do you know what? I've not. Oh, I can if I go into New York from a British shop. But I don't think I can from Wegmans, but I'll I, yeah, I'll take Milka. Milka's Milka's good. <laughs> well, we're here to talk. Tell us then. Tell us about your career journey. Tell us what, yeah. uh, I guess you're from an advisor in the UK and you've come Correct. out here. And so tell us yeah, about so that. I've worked through like the whole financial system in the UK, it feels like, to be honest. So started off in like the high net worth banking, that kind of team. And then like the relationship management piece, then moved into financial planning through banks, went through the whole RDR process of requalifying. So obviously you can tell I've been in finance a while. And then end up at a, like a real boutique financial planning firm, mini family office environment that had legal tax consulting for small right. business owners primarily. They consequently now have their own investment platform. But that really gave me more Who's of it. Who's that, Kath? Well, they're called Pridus. Pridus. So they're, they're on my LinkedIn. Who's the head of Pridus? It'll be the Priday family. Oh, that's not who I'm thinking. Okay. But yeah, so they, they basically, they introduced me more into the world of independence from a financial planning aspect. So really giving more of that, that rope rather than less of it and less restriction in the way of what you can and provide and what you can't provide. There was opportunity to really explore like the EIS and seed investment, venture capital environments, small business owners. And then when the pension regulator brought in auto enrollment plans, I was heavily involved in that element of it as well. Obviously, the small business owners aren't always happy about that situation. But so some of those conversations were quite difficult, but it obviously brought brought me a lot of that independence route. So I could definitely look at a little bit more than in the banking environment where you're very restricted to more of a product sale. It was very much more what the client wanted, that more fiduciary financial planner role that I really enjoyed. So that was until I left in 2016, which is when I moved to the U.S., and then I made a couple of mistakes over here, choosing kind of my first environment to work in was not a good fit. Definitely not for my vision of continuing that type of fiduciary planning piece. And then I worked for another like a boutique financial planning firm over here. Couldn't quite facilitate the vision enough through them. So I decided to start up my own financial firm. April 2020, that really fun month where everything shut down. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> 
<laughs> oh wow that is mm. talk about talk about I mean, the time to launch that's hilarious yep, um, with uh, hindsight i'm sure it wasn't hilarious at the time yeah it was great fun trying to get things pushed through when nobody was there <laughs> So hello, is anyone going to answer the phone? So I started my own RIA and it, being able to really, truly serve how I wanted to serve people and work with people how I knew I could work with them, being able to build them how I want to build them, ma making plans that are relevant to their individual situations rather than it being a off-the-shelf product or off-the-shelf solution. So what was the problem when you first got here? Were you working for like a broker dealers were you working for is it not rias like were you, was it, was it sale? like what was it what it was is a it broker, dealer. broker dealer yeah just not a good fit are they very, very sales popular. focused mm. are they just go out there and flog is it funds like what what's it like on that i've never worked on that side of it here is it is it's it very kind of cliche it's very heavily sales focused so there are huge sales targets and there is pressure to get those sales targets so you just meant to go out there and start slamming knocking on doors mutual funds to these people. Is that is it literally still that in 2020, 2019, or whatever it was, 2018? 2016, 17, yeah. So yeah, it was. Go out there, meet people, network them, sell the mutual funds. Mutual funds. Are we yeah. still talking mutual funds? Within, within accounts, within an IRA, within whatever, yeah. Or insurance. Insurance is a big commission player. Hence why we did not fit. Obviously going through RDR in the UK, there's no commission on investment business and anything outside of that kind of feels wrong now. It's like, how do you fit that into an ethical model of service in the right way when you've got a sales target? I don't know. For me, it was too much of a, and it doesn't just didn't fit with my kind of mm. mindset. And what happened with the financial planning firm? Was it just you were a Brit trying to serve Brits and they were Americans with it's just... A, and just they're, they're a great firm and they definitely supported me with creating my own firm. It was just like the, they were going through quite a lot of M&As, mergers and acquisitions, mm. and there wasn't the scope with me being so new to the country. I didn't have a huge book of business to for them to invest in to build out something that would help me facilitate that a little bit more. Yeah, they were really supportive when I left, really supportive with me setting up my own firm. Very well, let's happy. talk about you. Let's talk about your own firm then. Three yeah. years, three and a half years in, you overcame the yeah. pandemic. What's right. it been like? Who you, who, you know, so we all set up a business with a vision and then as we progress towards that, we, it takes its own, takes on a life of its own. So what are you doing? Who are you serving? How'd you find them? What's it like running your own so, business? Tell us everything. Yeah, it's a lot, isn't it? Yeah. I guess really the who I serve are the people like me. I don't believe in like that suited and booted behind a desk telling somebody what to do. For that, it doesn't feel relationship based. It doesn't feel like you're aligning with somebody where they're at. And I really want to be approachable. I think that's the one thing I've learned throughout my many years in finance is being approachable will make you a better advisor. You'll get more from the client and they'll give you more feedback and speak to you on a more individual level when you become a real person to them rather than somebody that they're either afraid of or they don't feel like they can ask questions because they don't know what the response will be serving people who are like me who've moved here and also we we do work with individuals who move back and also individuals who move elsewhere too we have a couple of clients that are very mobile with regards to where they live but they are brits and a couple of americans too that do that kind of multi-country consideration the one thing that I found was, and I know obviously your firm has like a minimum level of assets and things like that. We don't have a minimum, but we don't market either. So we don't have this mass amount of clients coming to us. Every client has come to us from like a word of mouth or through another advisor. We actually do co-advise with a lot of advisors as well in the US. One thing I found was some advisors just don't want to let go of their clients necessarily because there could be a really good relationship there but they may have a UK element of their portfolio. So we can always co-advise on that situation. Yeah, so we call that dovetailing. Yeah. Yeah. We can do that too. So it was really providing a variety of options that weren't just give me all of your assets and I'll manage them for a fee. That doesn't tend to work all the time. And as you guys know, it's, a lot of people come over here for the high salaries. They may not have a huge amount of assets. They may be mm -hmm. stuck somewhere. They may be invested in retirement accounts. That means they've got no liquid money to invest anywhere. And that kind of thought process for me was more about, okay, what's your high salary going to give you a large amount of income? How are we going to structure that to allow you to then really benefit from the things in the global system? So do you, I guess you're a subscription fee, a bit tiered completely tailored to every individual circumstance oh, yeah. based on complexity. Oh. 
and are they again is this completely does it depend on person or is it do people pay monthly do people pay annually they basically pay however they want to pay which sounds really like mm. opening the door to everything but i'm not in a lot of ways because we're not cheap we're not bottom of the barrel pricing we have minimum fees for certain things that we do so if for instance we do like a holistic financial plan it's normally over a four month period and they range from four to twelve thousand dollars so it depends mm. on that completely but there's no asset minimum requirement there we have some clients who do want to do more of a subscription so they have more of an access to me but they want to diy their own investments it totally works oh, really a lot of that diy nature as well is if for instance they are in a multitude of countries then we can help out with multi-currency accounts and invest in different currencies like i know i think you guys probably can as well but that sometimes works with some people for some of their assets, but then they might want to hold on to their US brokerage account that they've been managing since they were in their 20s mm. or whatever. And we can work with them on that basis too. So if someone approaches you and wants, just wants a one-time plan, like that four-month mm. engagement, you'll do that? Yep. Hey, we've, we're still young. We're like, we've been going five years and we've wrestled with all this stuff. And we decided against that because we're just a plan. Yeah, as you look, and I'm sure you tell people like, this is... It's immediately out of date. And f furthermore, it's it's all wrong. <laughs> yeah, it's still enormously valuable. Plan it's all about plan. We call plan first wealth. That's how much we believe yeah. in planning. But the, we, the, is, as the quote I always give is Eisenhower's, plan is worthless, planning is everything. So we've, we have done it in the past and then we just shied away from it because people would like, oh, well, it's great, thanks. And then walk away from us. We're like, we've told you things are all right, but they can, they, but they, we don't do it that very way. quickly. Yeah. I think that's one of the things is our financial plans aren't something that is just data based. So, for instance, we'll educate about like different types of retirement options in the UK and the US. We'll get them to get their Social Security and UK government state pension kind of benefits and what that would look like if they made, for instance, voluntary contributions to the UK, how much that would change their situation by. So a lot of it isn't about oh, fine, you're on track. It's more about that discovery element of what mm -hmm. are your options I will say we don't have, we, I think we have two people that are actually in retirement. It's more like an education piece in itself, right? This is like a, almost not like a textbook, like a personalized textbook or roadmap for you Correct. then on how, it what you map. can tell, you call it a yep. roadmap. Yeah. Yeah. We've done that before. Yep. So yeah, it's not really different. saying to them based on now you're fine. It's basically more about, okay, these are the steps that you need to take. These are the actions that you need to do on a regular basis. Yeah. What we tend to find, I would say, is about 70% after we do that report with them, we'll say, can you just do all the actions? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Have you had it, though, where you've had people DIY and then you've mm -hmm. subsequently found out that they've done something really silly, you know, frank, dumb, <laughs> or so against their own best interest that maybe if they'd been working with you wouldn't have happened or if you'd been there. Famous Carl Richards napkin of mm -hmm. like between you and the big mistake is a financial advisor or your advisor have you ever had have you ever experienced that in yeah a couple of times when they basically just didn't take action when they were supposed to take action so maybe missed a big market movement for instance that really affected their overall portfolio of wealth especially those who are like in a real concentrated employer say rsus or something like that and they may have not sold out at the right time but they'll come and tell me that they didn't do it and then they'll be like i should have listened to you can you now do this yeah, yeah. So yeah sometimes humans just have to make mistakes. You. We're not going to require them to get us to complete the actions that we recommend. But that's why we have such a high take up of people who say, can you then do all these actions for us? Because I don't actually have worked out I don't have the time. And we allow them to come for that whenever they want. So it might be like six months down the line. They're like, look, this is just taking too much time. Can you just take it over? And that's when we would then step in at that point. But with our reports, our like roadmaps, we do require them to, we do recommend that they at least meet up with us once in the following year. It's a free additional consult in a year's time just to see how things have settled and how much they have actioned. Yeah, super interesting. So we wrestle with propositions and fees all the time. An event, we're at a point now where we wrestle with it and tinker with it so much. We're just putting the finishing touches to our proposition right now. And then we need to stop. We need to just step away from the vehicle and run with it for a few years and just let it get, gain traction rather than trying to keep perfecting and perfecting it. But 
I've worked with tried one time plans. We've tried fees for plans. We've tried we, we've tried. I've, we do an AUM fee. We've had tiered AUM fees. We're defaulting now to a single unified AUM fee across everything. I've got a fixed fee schedule in my head. Like I know if AUM fees went away tomorrow, I know exactly what we would pivot to. I just haven't because the AUM fee for all its imperfections is just so easy. It's easy to understand. It's easy to explain. It's easy for clients to grasp. It's easy to facilitate. I just don't know what. It's interesting where we're going to be in tech. RDR was huge and it completely changed the UK industry. That might happen. Yeah, it's happened here, arguably, as we've moved the move away from broker dealers to RIAs is only gathering steam. It is. Um, I would say I do feel like we still are about 25 years behind over here mm. from where it needs to be for the client's clarity. I think part of the other issue over here is the amount of gurus and TikTok people and finance experts who have absolutely zero qualification in anything, but people will take their advice as absolutely 100% gold because financial advisors just want to rip them off with commission products. That mindset is so ingrained in society as a whole because realistically there's not enough follow-up on legislation and this is probably part of my whole rant about how financial services is so disjointed because every state has their own specific rules that aren't at all linked whatsoever. And you can just have a 20 mile radius difference between one state and another, and there's completely different rules on finance, yet you're working in the same cities and things like that. But I feel like over here, there needs to be some more requirement when it comes to being able to call yourself a financial professional or expert or guru or give even guidance over here as well. It's just so anyone and everybody that it really waters down what it means to be a professional in the industry that's my you know no i agree with you the idea that someone from the wirehouses or the broker dealers or whatever is calling themselves a financial advisor versus they're equating that to fiduciary fee only fiduciary and then you have insurance guys don't even get me started the insurance industry here is wild so i a few years ago thinking i want i wanted to add insurance to my practice i actually passed mm-hmm. I passed the New York license to get to sell insurance. Still don't understand it. Still, still <laughs> find it. Still, and if I can't understand it, having actually passed the New York license, this is years ago. I've let it lapse. I've never sold yeah. insurance here. If I can't understand it, there's no way other people can. And it's just this stuff is just crazy. And then it what? It you so much, and that's part. Of, I think the problem is it's such a money focused sales environment, and they the premiums aren't cheap either. I don't know. I don't know what you found, but like UK insurance is so cheap in comparison. Like the premiums are just like 10 times the amount just for a basic policy. Have you seen what everyone is pitching here online on the TikTok and Unreal? I saw one, I think it was this morning or last night where there's like these expert experts in inverted commas pitching this like alternative finance where it's using IUL or whatever it's called. And it's just a massive scam. (laughs) It's hugely beneficial for the advisors, hugely, because their commissions are massive on it. Yeah, there are companies. Not to put too fine a point on it, and we won't name names. There are companies that are that's their entire business model. Essentially, is yep. fomenting that kind of. I tell you, strategy. Yeah, that's where I think that the industry as a whole needs some real clarification about what people call themselves. The names are there's just so many names: financial consultant, financial advisor, financial planner, wealth manager, wealth advisor, wealth consultant. Who know? How is a client supposed to understand any of that? Yeah. We'll take on clients and semi regularly. There'll, there'll be an annuity in there or oh, some yeah. sort of insurance product. And every time, every single time, without fail, this is not hyperbole, we get the documentation off them. We have a look at it. Number one, it is not what the client thinks it is. Never, not even close. Mm-hmm. Clients, yeah. Client will tell us in the in fact finding stage, oh, I've got this policy. It does this and this. We'll pick it up. It doesn't do that, 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 and that. Mm-hmm. And it's always drastically less generous than they think it is. Drastically. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. Yeah. Even with just general insurances as well. Like people say, I don't know if I can keep my insurance if I move to the UK or if I go overseas, I don't know what it looks like. I'm like, you can keep it, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it'll pay out what you think it's going to pay out. And a lot of the actual insurance policies that I've done some reviews on recently actually have a reduced amount if you are overseas. So like, like long-term care no. policies won't pay out anywhere near what they're, they'd pay out if you were a US resident at that time it was paying out. I um, don't know that. Like that yeah. Yeah, the long-term care policies also. I didn't do much long-term care in the UK, but if I remember, long-term care covered you while you're in care. Here, it's like you get two years. 
it depends on the policy. Again, it's all specific to whatever policy and provider yeah. they give. Yeah. Tell us about this coaching business. Yeah, so I wouldn't really call it necessarily coaching. It's more like an online course business. So I think that by having no minimum, we do get a lot of people in that very early stage where they probably don't, they don't necessarily always have the income levels to be able to afford the financial planning elements that we yeah. provide. But they still have a need for understanding the US, UK complexities. And a lot of them who come here from, say, the UK or even Europe, like they'll think that like their credit score can transfer over or or that banking works in exactly the same way. And I obviously the UK is part of this open banking structure where I can transfer from one banking institution to another in 10 seconds. That I don't know where that exists in the US, if it even does ever exist. But when I first came here and I was like, what do you mean it's going to take three days for my money to go from my savings account to my checking account? Like what? Mm. Where does that make sense? And again, it's because of that state structure where, because it's not the same in every state, you haven't got the same regulations that the banks are working to. So they can't transfer to each other very quickly. So everything moves at that slower pace, but there's the pressure to make it move faster too. Kath, did you arrive here thinking that, yeah, you knew about the 50 states, but you basically thought the US was one big I thought country. they spoke to each other. I thought they spoke yeah. to each other at least as a minimum. I've been surprised by the complexity, the bureaucracy, the red tape, the expense, the challenges that come from the 50 individual states. And especially as an RIA trying to register with more than one state, it's... Yeah. And every year you get, there's a nasty surprise because you've triggered something somewhere. Well, how did that happen? And it's just, it's painful. It's, it's totally unnecessary and it just, it feels unnecessary to me. Yeah, no, I would agree. I think it it definitely is part of the reason why I don't think that the legislation is where it needs to be on a federal level yet on roping in these wily people who may be selling IULs under a new alternative family wealth generational transfer point of strategy whatever it is <laughs> yeah. I mean the fact that you know people can call themselves an expert and they have such big traction is is quite substantial when you look at the number of people in that kind of space providing their kind of advice which is why I think creating this these online courses because they're created by myself and another individual she's actually certified she's been running a financial literacy nonprofit. she was involved heavily involved in that for a while that we can basically create this from actual information with links to respective places where we've received that information because obviously we know Google can give you a lot of answers it can give you the right one, but it can give you its opinions too. So trying to find an answer on Google or Facebook or TikTok or Instagram or, or wherever you're looking, you'll get different answers pretty much from everywhere. So really the idea of this is to give specific content with the links to where we found that information. So it really provides that clarity that we're not just saying this is our opinion on this. This is the specific legislation that affects this rule. So it's not coaching. It's not coaching per se. It's it's specific courses like someone signs up and they get they go through a what, 12 week course or four week how's it it's all self-paced they can do it whenever and then we do offer a coaching model that we're still building out afterwards where they can then hire for a couple of hours they'll do like a three hour section or maybe a very short group course where we'll talk about building a u.s credit score versus uk credit score and talk through that or it might just be about how to actually look at different expenses in the u.s because depending, again, on which state you live in, you might be paying state taxes, you might be paying property taxes instead, or a sales tax. It's all so different that having that environment where you can get together with other people in a very similar circumstance and talk through those things is probably useful, but you're not going to be able to afford me to be able to do that from the financial yeah. planning aspect. I imagine there's a lot of work that goes into building... Yeah, we've been it's, building for about two years now. <laughs> it's one of those that you have to get the course content, you have to get the coaching programs drawn up, you have to then get obviously the social media, the website and everything else done as well. So it's not just the content, it's everything within it. But I think there is a big place for those. And we actually are going to have the courses in both English and Spanish to start with. So I think there is a lot of call out there for people to be able to understand the financial industry when they move to the US, because the US is made up of a bunch of different countries immigrating into it. So I think that having the access to that information is going to be really useful, especially when salary doesn't warrant us to get involved or step in or their complexity of their situation is very simple and we don't need to provide them with full financial planning. So something that just gives them something they can work with and somebody they have access to if they want to ask further questions or join in a coaching group, that is where we see that fitting in. I think you're on something there. 
Are you, do you know, are you familiar with Pete Matthew in the UK? Meaningful Money? Yes, I am. He's from your neck of the woods, right? Ex- he's a bit further. Yeah. He's at the, ver- the tip. He's, a, I think he's a fantastic guy. He is preaching that the future is financial coaching. And I think you might be right. But again, I think my the, the issue I have with that is who is giving that coaching? Pete, great, because I know he's very qualified, but there's so many who'll just jump on that because it's an unregulated environment. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah, he's not yeah, he's aware of that. I saw him post something this week about influ. But I think he posted this week something about influencers who are actually now getting their qualifications, their financial advice qualifications, which is a good sign. It is, and as I think it's just how is that then regulated? Because I think part of the problem is, as I said, like you can do a qualification, great, but are you actually being a fiduciary or are you not? really doing that are you giving advice when you probably shouldn't be giving general advice are you reporting that correctly because as we know running an ria there is so much we have to do from a compliance perspective oh we know (laughs) that should be the case for everybody not just us who actually have a physical ria you should be doing that and you should be doing right by the client regardless of whoever you are or however you're working in the financial industry i do think it's different though Kath, if you're not if you're not selling it's yes we're managing investments that's gonna be regulated if you're selling insurance if you do but if you're advice only and i'm not sure that needs to be as heavily regulated you think if you're if someone's then going if someone's then going back using mm. deep vanguard or something to do it themselves yeah i think they should be personally just because i've seen so much bad advice given by people who aren't qualified oh you just need to go on facebook to see that oh it's just I joined some of these mm-hmm. Facebook British groups recently, and oh, but the advice given on there is wild. Some of it's just like their for advice is unwittingly break the law. And when someone says, "No, nah, you probably shouldn't do that," like, I've done it for thirty years, never had a problem. It's just, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. and some of these who say, "Oh, you don't need to tell them about that." Yes. Who's? Oh you know god! Don't get me started. Don't get me started. Yeah. You don't need to. Why is it their business? There's no. And tax question I've had is that oh, you can invest in funds in the UK. You just, you just don't oh. need to say that you're an American connected individual. Oh please no. And that then here's a you humongous p issue with 25 p that we've now got to report on and try and get out of that have all got huge issues with gains and reporting requirements and everything else. So. Oh, yeah, people just step <laughs> away from the Facebook machine. For, and that's where, that's where I think, because I think this, I think different sectors have different requirements almost of how much they should be regulated because the cross border space is too complex for it to be anybody and everybody. I do get a couple of advisors just give me clients because they don't want to explore that area. I mean, if I wasn't in this space, I would, I, and someone came along knowing what I know, I'd be like, I can't help you. Here you go. And I, but that's what I think it's knowing what you know. And also as a fiduciary, I feel like our requirement as a fiduciary is if somebody else is better than us in that specific topic, if somebody comes to me and they're, they're a German citizen living in the US, I'm going to probably reach out to my colleague who deals with German citizens because she lives right. around there and she's a US qualified individual too. So having that like collaboration, I feel is part of a fiduciary requirement, but as you said, people who call themselves a fiduciary are everywhere. So how do you break down that and make it very clear that you cannot do this if you are not doing that? So your money matters. Is that regulated? No, so reg- that'll, be an, no. that'll be an online course company only. So it's providing education. It'll have like same disclaimers like the podcast. That... And will that be, will people pay a one-time fee for the course or will it be a subscription model? So, no, the courses will be like a one-time fee and we've priced them very low to allow for, allow for entry at a very low amount. We are looking at probably having a couple of like affiliate groups, maybe it's advisors or maybe it's immigration attorneys, things like that can then provide this information to people that does have like, I said, the IRS links, the gov.uk links, the treaty agreements, things like that in it that are really useful to have all in one place and having those individuals in those kinds of arenas refer people into them. It's another stream of income for their practice but it's also kind of them doing a better duty to individuals they're helping emigrate into the u.s immigrate into the u.s leave the u.s providing them with an extra level of protection because immigration attorneys can be great on getting you here but that's where their they their knowledge and requirements end yeah yeah so this is live is it it's already live you've been working over two years not quite so we are live but we aren't launched if that makes sense when do you think you'll launch so we're aiming for the 1st of January this year with all of the courses going. We've got about 12 different courses on there going live. 
So give me an idea of what, I mean, imagine one is coming to the US and one is right. exiting the US. What are the, what are some of the others? Like building a small business from scratch with no credit score, mm -hmm. how to cr get a credit score when you come to the country with nothing. Just kind of like some of those step-by-steps. We've got one for divorcing individuals, including cross-border divorce consideration. Oh God, you're right. I might need to take that one. Not because I'm getting divorced, but because I've had clients come to me and I'm like, I don't, it, we've tried to introduce some different people and it's what a nightmare yeah i do quite a bit of consulting on divorce cases for uk accounts and things like that or for uk clients so if they're getting divorced in the uk but they have us assets i've done a couple of those recently where i've just consulted on the us assets and broken them down as to giving those attorneys and lawyers an explanation of how they work because again a uk attorney is not going to understand how a 401k works versus an ira they're not going to know the difference so providing some of that information like the financial piece to cross-border divorce but also wow. highlighting obviously when it comes to like child custody issues you can't just take them out of the country and that be it so it's more of a kind of holistic picture for them rather than it just be in a these are the steps you need to take very cool very cool all right so if anyone wants to reach out to you, Kath, where yeah. can they find you? So they can find us on our website, which is 5efinancial.com. We do currently have a wait list for clients. We aren't currently taking on clients this month or next month. We do have a wait list. I think it starts in November for our next possible opening. So if somebody's got something urgent, probably not best to reach out to us. But you're more than welcome to reach out to us via social media as well. We're on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. I think that's about it right now and then your financial matters that's going to be everywhere including pinterest as well so we've got a little bit further reach with that yeah so what's the plan to promote your money matters so it'll really be reaching out to our existing professional connections that we have that i said like attorneys lawyers accountants people in the cross-border space that don't necessarily provide that extra piece of where to go to find this information and then obviously bookkeepers and accountants for the small business side they may get people starting up businesses that have never started one in the us before it is a very different environment and you can't just move to the uk and keep your us lc just like that either talking about some of those tax complications that they need to investigate and hire a professional for so it's, as i said it's reaching out to those professional connections that we already know but if anybody in the cross-border space wants to ask a bit more about it we can always let them know too cool you're a busy bee I know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and with a two-year-old as well, who's like a little whirlwind child. Luckily, the older one is not, but the younger one is definitely keeps me on my toes. But that's why we try not to take on too many clients at the same time and try and give our existing clients a good service level. Are, are most of your clients, would you say, are mo do most people come on, on a regular servicing schedule? Most do the report and then they come on an either AUM or a fixed fee for their investment management. Yeah. I would say that's most it, only if they're like very astute in their own finances. We get a couple of people, we've got a couple of people who've worked for like startups in maybe in the finance space, but they may like investing, but they don't know the structure of everything. So like we've done a few financial plans for those types of environments too, or clients who don't have liquid assets, but they need structure on maybe family inheritance or something like that. Do you find, have you come across people having with trust in the UK? <laughs> Yeah. Just yeah. You, you might have, and it's often it's the parents have set up a trust and then they've passed away and they've not realised that for the last 10, 15 years like that there's the, just a massive on. problem. Yeah. Yep. And yeah. And just like to actually change um get their parents to change them from being a beneficiary on their trust. So. Just to avoid just to remove that problem going forward. Yeah. yeah. We've got a client unwinding it right now. It's just where that cross border space, I guess, needs that kind of level of regulation. In fact, of people are given advice by people who are US specific only, and they don't take it into consideration what yeah. that looks like elsewhere. Or, but also in the UK, these a lot of the times it's U, the yeah. UK trust is set up and they've got no idea about the US, and it's unique to the US a lot of the times. A lot of these troubles are not. So, you know, there's only the US and Eritrea that have any requirement for citizenship based taxation. Yeah. And Eritrea is something like, by the way, it's something like 2% or two, yeah. two grand. It's whatever it is, it's yeah. a tiny amount. It's, very, like, very, it's very not hard. the same. It's based, nope. it's, it is on a high level citizenship based taxation, but it's not the same as being a US. And it's in one sense, I'm glad for it because we're a specialist in this area and it's, it's, we've got what well, we can add. Being a financial advisor can add massive value. Mm -hmm. Being a financial advisor in this space can add enormous, tremendous value. We call it opportunities and landmines taking advantage of opportunities but avoiding the landmines and there's much worth here in avoiding the landmines as there is yeah. taking advantage of the opportunities but also the more i know the more it scares me because it's just like around every corner there's something lurking 
I will say we do tax prep for our clients only. We don't do random tax prep for people. We only do it for our existing clients. And honestly, some of the, even some of the tax returns that are done by those who've never had experience in the US space, they don't even know how to detail an account on like an FBAR report, for instance. Like we've got one client has been reporting it as a cash account and it's a mutual fund. Yeah. So five years, they've had this fund that we now need to unwind because it's a PFIC. And we need to backdate how we've reported that to you. Yeah. A lot of landmines. And again, I think having to do this for my own situation has definitely been where I've continued seeing the value is I know how difficult it is for me. And I had all of those years experience in finance. Yeah. It's so, a similar journey for me. Yeah. It's difficult. I'm trying to get that message out there. And then when I go on Facebook and I see people giving bad advice and everyone else. I just go to H&R Block and pay a few hundred dollars. I want to just, I have to step away. I might want to scream, no, just don't, please, for the love of God, go and see, pay a little bit more. And And there are people out there who can definitely do like their own investing and things like that. I'm not taking that away from anyone who can DIY their own things. But when it comes to, okay, this is a complex situation. There are those of us out here that can help in a fee only environment. It doesn't have to be taking all your money and managing your investments if you want to manage them. But there are opportunities out there for you to come and get an hour consult or whatever it is. But you just have to be very specific and let people collaborate on this too. Kath, we say this, I, and, I'm, and I say this tongue in cheek, but I'm deadly serious. I think there's two expat acts of madness. Number one, and intention number one is not paying someone to do your taxes. And if I expand on that, oh, it gets too wordy, it's not having a cross-border specialist to do your taxes because you're just asking for trouble as an expat. You just really, and that's got, that we've got no skin in that game. I'm not conflicted offering that advice whatsoever. That's my first piece of advice. Find a cross-border specialist, UK, US, there's not many of them around, and pay them to do your taxes every single year and share everything with them. Mm-hmm. And then the the other act of madness is, I do I agree people can do their own, can manage their investments, but I do think entering into retirement managing your own affairs is an act of madness because <laughs> when you've been when you've been working and saving and markets go up and they go down and then your pot money's over there but you're living off this money here it feels bad but it's fine once your salary goes away and that pot money becomes everything to you your relationship to it changes I, and even if you are perfectly capable of managing your own money you are still a human being and going into oh. retirement without a plan and without someone between you and that money and someone between you and that trigger I think is an act of madness, but I am conflicted on that one. I will admit it. Yeah. So I do think people can manage their own money, but there are also people out there who are like, this is overwhelming. I have children running around. I have my own job full time. And that's the reason me, I wouldn't go and do my own oil change because I'm not lazy, but I just don't have the time to learn how to do it on my car. So I'll take it to a professional who knows how to do it. Same as if I don't feel too great, I'll go and see a doctor. That's why our profession is here for those people who don't want to do it and do need the help. I said, I really do not want to learn about changing my oil or filters in my car. I'm just not. I'll get someone else to do that for me. Exactly. You've got to find someone you trust though, right? That's always the challenge. Yeah. Righty ho. Kath, well, thank you so much for being on Plan First Wealth and Friends. It was great to have you. Yeah, no, it's been a pleasure. It's been enjoyable and good to talk to a fellow Brit who understands my need to have my cup of tea at hand all the time. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Hang on. We'll go. We'll wrap up here, James, and but I'll hand over to you. Yeah, so reach out to Kath. Anyone listening, certainly 5 e Financial online. You can find us at our website, planfirstwealth.com. And if you're watching on a channel other than our Facebook, join our exclusive British expat group. It's called Wealth Hub US UK. Again, that's Wealth Hub US UK. Thanks so much for watching all. Take care. Bye.